The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Thanks for joining me once again for another chapter of orchestration analysis of Mars, the bringer of war. We left off just before figure four, and it's pretty much at this point, very aggressive marcato strings, basically playing a big E flat minor six, three chord. So in other words, with the minor third on the bottom, Going on here, I've actually covered this particular section talking about the tenor tuba and discussing how ingenious and how much of a zeitgeist this particular approach to orchestration was in another video, one of my video orchestration tips. And I will just uh, once again link it in the uh, upper right-hand corner if you want to click to that and take a look at it now. So I'm not going to really go over what I said there, except to just mention, once again, it's a wonderfully apt emotional moment. This is the first real solo line in this entire piece, and it's given to an instrument that has not a humdrum quality, but has a certain quality of simplicity and directness and earthiness. So in this context, really kind of like a blunt call to war by somebody making an emotional point that is not very intelligent, <laughs> really, and answered by the trumpets leaping on the whole notion of going to war. Yes, that's a great idea. I think that that's what's meant to be expressed here in this section. But let's just talk about the orchestration of it. Of course, uh, the tenor tuba, it's uh, a fairly loud instrument, and of course the trumpets will have no problem uh, also playing over the strings. So, so the accompaniment is very, very simple, but it's also wonderfully direct as well. These marcato strings simply marking out time here in slightly creepy voicings of these chords. The last thing that I want to remind you about this page is that our tenor tuba part has the exact same transposition as a bass clarinet. So reading up a ninth, up a major ninth, from the sounding pitches. So in other words, this would be a D, right? Uh, D natural, which coming in uh, over the top of an E flat minor chord is sort of an E flat minor major seventh chord, which, you know, has its own kind of cloudy, strange character. Something to add about this if you're getting used to reading bass clef notation and just, you know, really learning to recognize a pitch like this as sounding D right above middle C, then you should think that it's really not the same thing in terms of registers. Now, where is the tenor tuba's best registers? In the way that Holst is scoring it here with this particular transposition, it really is kind of like from written middle C up to about G or A flat. So that is really the sweet spot, and it's scored beautifully across the treble staff. So you can see why this kind of transposition would be just perfect for the tenor tuba, capturing its best qualities across the simplest kind of clef. Now, this solo pretty much just does the same exact thing twice, and so does the accompaniment. Let's turn the page, and you can see that the only thing that changes is the first trombone coming in right under the trumpets as they basically just move up to another chord, pushing the music into this next section here. Now, it's a very simple setup. A3 bassoons and contra bassoon coming in on the lowest notes here, pretty much the same exact notes as the cello and double basses. And then this rip up here, which is really scored in a rather unique way. You've got both sets of violins, firsts and seconds, being doubled by A2 flutes. But the piccolo, instead of playing the same written pitches, sounding an octave higher, 
the first piccolo is sounding two octaves higher, right? And that has this wonderful flash of color. And this is a trick that you yourself might employ in scoring, just to have that kind of little rip following for just a second over something like this, um, pushing up into the downbeat of the next bar. Even though it's going up into the piercing range of the piccolo, it really isn't all that screechy because it's just so brief. Now, here we get into some really beautiful, really effective, and yet simple scoring that takes some shortcuts and yet has a very strongly string-like sound against this big section here of winds and horns. The sound of the strings come through very easily because you have both sections of violins playing exactly the same notes. So this is in a big, big orchestra. This might be maybe 36 players altogether, 38 players. With that many violins playing, Ah Two Flutes adds just enough force there to solidify the line. And it doesn't really need a whole lot of doubling from below. And yet we've got the horns adding just a little bit here and there, as well as the clarinets reinforcing that top line, and yet adding a lot of harmony as well, especially in these little sections here. Meanwhile, the second and third clarinets are joining up with the oboes and English horn, English horn sounding down a fifth, right? So this is an A, a bunch of A's in a row which are two octaves above these bassoon A's right here, and an octave above this horn A, this horn sounding A, and doubling this uh, written E here, which is also A. So you have that A just coming in really, really clear uh, as this kind of pounding on the beat rhythm, along with the rest of the harmonization. Now, with all of this texture and all of this support of the melody and the strings, it takes very, very little force for the trumpets to join in, or first trumpet solo to join in and just add a little bit of commentary. One thing that you may notice here is that the fullness of the strings in this section right here tend to drop off quite a bit. Now, it doesn't matter quite as much because you have clarinets and oboes still covering some of that same longer sustained harmony along with the bassoons. I really love the, what the bassoons are doing here and the voicing of this overall wind chord here. That's really lovely. And the tremolo gives it a little bit of quivering life in the middle of the chord, but it does have a much weaker sense of force. You know, even with all of the strings playing quite loudly left over from a couple of pages ago when they were marked at forte fortissimo, you know, they still are playing with a lot of force. There's nothing in the score that has told the strings to knock off on their physical energy. All the same, uh, everybody else is also playing loudly and it isn't really until this big push here into the next idea that you have the strings come back. But I think that that's fine. It, it, it is a little weak, but it still works. Notice the doubling here. We have the violas and the second violins starting off with a simple unison, then with the violas dropping to an octave lower as it approaches this octave here. And that actually is another really fun way to compromise. Obviously, the violas cannot start on a G below the C, below middle C, right? They cannot start on a G2 that is out of range. So they have to start right on the same note as the second violins. But it's probably not a wise idea to push them this high, especially if you don't really need that note as a melody note playing along with the first and second violins. So... The answer is just to drop the violas, and then you actually get a little bit more energy out of it with the note below, the octave note below, 
it really gives kind of a, a cumulative addition of energy. Now, the clarinets are pretty much the only instrument of the upper winds that can really play all the way through with that second violin and viola line. Notice that the oboes come in a little bit late because they're not really even needed. And then they drop off here because he doesn't want to push those oboes all the way up to that top F. And he doesn't really even need them on that top F with these flutes coming in in the strong part of their range. Besides, the oboes are put to much better use down here along with the English horn in playing this middle harmony. But just as I said, and, and I've mentioned in other courses on woodwinds, this is really a great example of using the strongest registers of each of the woodwind family. Of course, the clarinets can play all the way throughout their Shalomo and Clarino registers with pretty much equal strength, except for a little bit of the throat tones, which are not always as strong and as colorful, but I mean, they can still be pretty strong if played in the right way. Then this is really the sweet spot of the range for oboes, actually more starting around E flat and F, and then going up to G, and even up to, say, A and B flat. But this is just a good place to drop off. And then, of course, the flutes coming in right as their range becomes stronger and brighter. Then everybody ending on this F, including the piccolo once again coming in and just, you know, adding a little bit of color on top. And this time a little bit more emphatically, not dropping off as it did here, but, you know, maintaining a presence for most of the time and also reinforcing the harmonic partials above these strings here. So it's a very, very powerful melodic line amidst all of this chaos and and uh, banter that is going on with the winds and the horns, and even this harmonization coming in here with the third and fourth trumpet and the trombones. Now let's talk about the scoring of this little reaction melody here. This long note is going to have to sort of fend for itself while there's this enormous energy and focus is put into this little dun da 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 basically a little B-flat major idea. Notice that the horns are playing exactly the same pitches, right? Because C trumpets are concert pitch instruments, and this is notated transposing up a perfect fifth from this, right? So it's basically what you read here in these horns is the same exact thing as this line here. That's sometimes a good way for you to not really cheat, but learn to just recognize what's going on with your eyes and quickly reference things as you're moving along a page of score quickly. If it's pretty apparent that there is a lot of doubling going on in brass or winds, and there is a C instrument that is taking the main line, you can quickly compare with a transposing instrument like this, uh, these F horns, or these B flat clarinets, and just quickly understand what is going on. For instance, these A3 clarinets are the same exact pitches as these oboes and flutes. And this has just a tremendously powerful quality. Both C flutes, both oboes, all three clarinets, and then an octave lower, all six horns, and both upper trumpets are, you know, they're all just playing Dun, da, 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 but somehow the staccato helps things not get overwhelmed. Plus, this high G here in the trumpets is enough, just this one single high G is enough to give the kind of support that the first and second violins need to not get overwhelmed, especially by the flutes and piccolos that are sort of crossing around this G here. And then this is just exactly the same thing again with a higher destination note, a high A there. Notice that that same note is being played by the third trumpet, too. So that, once again, helps to support that. I really like the way that the timpani trade off, rolling along with the horns and setting up 
this sort of very swashbuckling rhythm here that's accompanying the main melody. Then pounding away as this little reaction melody happens. And then changing the pitch to an A here. That's kind of cool. From the F to the A and then holding on to the pounding F right here. So this is just a beautifully crafted couple of pages of score and especially how it opens out here. This is one of those things that really shows the mastery of Holst as an orchestrator, I feel. It's very simple and effective and imaginative and yet really gripping in a cinematic way. Let's have a listen to that and think of all of those things, the massive doubling in octaves here of the brass below, the upper winds above with the piccolo icing on top, and how well the violins are able to hold on to this note because of the trumpet, the high trumpet note here and there, right? Also, think of some of those things that we discussed here, how the string melody is being supported by the flutes above here, what the sound is like of the double reeds and the clarinets, and also these horns I didn't really talk about very much, but they are basically supporting some of the harmony in the violas and even expanding on it and filling in some of the harmony below. So let's have a listen to that whole thing, then we'll move on to the next figure. After that very heroic, very swashbuckling page that we just listened to, now we're going to see things stripped back to a very military, very practical, somewhat hard-headed, <laughs> uh, and very barren kind of an arrangement. There's almost nothing orchestral about these seven bars here. If we look at this, it's just basically trumpets pacing out all five beats per measure with a little tattoo on the snare drum and rolled cymbals to give it sort of a cloudy background. Tenor tuba returns on the same pitches as before, and it sets up a little uh, kind of a round here, sort of like a very evil, <laughs> very militaristic version of row, row, row your boat. The tenor tuba leaps up to written F, which is actually E flat down here, and the trumpet, though it looks like it's playing the same general register, is actually playing an octave higher than the sounding pitches of this tenor tuba, right? So this is concert C right on the nose. And this also reaches up to a sounding E flat, right? This written F here is a sounding E flat down a ninth. And this game goes on, now reaching up to written F sharp, sounding E. Trumpet imitates it, goes up to E, and then the tenor tuba is going to push it even higher, up to A-flat. But instead of going to sounding F-sharp here above the staff, Holst throws in just a different harmonic context here. Once again, I'm not going to go over the exact harmony or everything. There are other resources I'm sure you could find for that, or you could just pick it apart yourself looking at the piano score and work out a lot of this harmony. I'm just really interested in the orchestration and coaching you on that here. But it's still just just a beautifully troublesome, <laughs> troublesome heroicism is the way that I look at it. It's kind of like people blindly marching into a battle here. Now the tenor tuba is going to reach up to this sounding A flat here, which is would be <clears throat> A flat above middle C, and that is exactly what the tenor trombones reach up to. So this is just octaves here. That is A flat below middle C and A flat above middle C, and it has this wonderful sound when it's doubled with the bass tuba and tenor tuba playing in octaves here and going, you know, medium high in their ranges, really. 
and it just it just has this little punch. Notice that it isn't holding throughout the entire sustained note. It's just a little bit of color, a little bit of punch right at the beginning, but it's just wonderfully effective here in also in setting up a bit of imitation going back and forth between the two sets of brass instruments. Meanwhile, the strings and winds start to freak out. Notice that they're doubling each other. Really, the oboes here and English horn, also doubled by all three clarinets. It's the same exact pitches. And the violins and viola are playing those pitches too. So it has just this wonderful scurrying sound. Uh, just almost like everybody is kind of scurrying to get out of the way as they're about to, I guess, drop a shell on some poor installation of the other guys in the battle. It's a very um, black and white sort of vision of war and military. And this is another thing where I feel that World War I, though it didn't really influence the composition of the notes of Mars, it influenced the sense of utter devastation uh, that was imbued into the orchestration, because certainly it, this was orchestrated while the war was going on and the reports were coming back from the front. And I feel that if Hulse did not have a completely clear vision of just how ugly and just how horrific he was going to make the orchestration, I think that that would have easily given him the emotional frame of mind to do that in. That does not mean that I am absolutely sure about this, but I find it hard to dissociate the two. So anyhow, going on, we have that same scurrying coming back and really covering, nicely covering the middle to lower and then upper range of the violins. And just this wonderful line here. I love this line that the violas and cellos are playing in octaves here. And then just just really jolting and dancing up to very, very high notes indeed for the whole string group, except for the double basses. All of that is just doubled in various ways by the winds as well. But I still see this as more of a string passage than a wind passage. You notice the continuity of the strings here, especially the violins, are playing all the way through. Now, things get a little low here, and then there's a drop-off on the downbeat. But generally speaking, the strings are playing all the way through. But the winds are basically dropping out and just compensating and coming back in and everything else, and overlapping into one another. For instance, here as the Atu flutes get up to this C above the staff, that's taken over by the piccolos, and then the flutes come back in an octave lower, just like we saw with the violas on the previous page, uh, as they started with the second violins and then dropped an octave. Uh, because really, honestly, only the piccolos can go all the way up to this A up here. The doubling basically is whatever it can be to play right alongside the strings. And of course, there is a wind quality to this. But really, once again, as I was saying before, I feel this is more of a string passage. I really love these horns right here, just holding this just very dastardly harmony here. And the lowest note of the you know, played by the sixth horn is being doubled by the bass trombone. And notice the difference here in dynamic. It's basically just a support note thrown in there. Holst knows that if he gives a fortissimo note here on this high A flat to the bass trombone, it is just going to shout over everything and just swamp everything. However, he just really wants some solidity there on that bottom A flat slash G sharp. So he is just really <laughs> making sure that it's got some support, even if it's not very loud support. Now, this same chord is reiterated here, extremely low. So let's take a little bit of time to pick this apart. Notice the minor seventh that is built into this. 
the written D-sharp and C-sharp above it, which is really uh, G-sharp below and F-sharp above. Now that is played very low. Let's look at our concert pitch bass instruments here of bassoons and contrabassoon. You've got your low G-sharp here, you've got your F-sharp up a minor seventh, and then you've got C-thirds above that. These two low pitches are being doubled, of course, by the cellos and double basses. Then you've got that same C here in the violas, and then A, the lowest note that the violins can possibly get to. And that is being doubled by the English horn, and by the first clarinet, and so on. And so it's just extremely, extremely firm sound. This little A minor 6-4 chord is being played by both trios of horns. And then, of course, you've got low A's on your trumpets. Um, it doesn't say A2 ah, here. It might in, I might have left that out when I transferred this score over to a graphics file. But I would assume that that would be A2 ah, trumpets. And then tenor trombones, also playing a low C third. They're still in tenor clef. And then this beautiful low F sharp played by the bass trombone. And low G sharp here sounding in unison with the double basses down here. And you know, the funny thing is, as weird as that looks on the page, it just sounds beautiful. It just has this just wonderfully devastating quality. Um, once again, just like a death blow, you know what I mean? Just the complete cessation of any kind of pity or humanity or any other kind of thing. It just really is a incredibly bleak sound. Uh, one last thing, of course, is the low G sharp of the double basses and contrabassoon are being doubled by a low organ pedal here. And then, of course, we've got a little bit of rolled bass drum and a low rolled G sharp on the timpani. So there are inherent conflicts in this kind of harmony, but that's what really makes it delicious. You know, the, just the beautiful dissonance of this. And I feel that this is where you see the enormous debt that Holst owes to Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra. It's this kind of imagination along with a very liberated sense of harmony. Let's have a listen to this whole page now and think about all of those things, about how the character of the music just strips down from the previous generous orchestral sound to a very, very militaristic, very simplistic sound. And then the quality of the two different groups of brass, the octave tubas getting a little spike from the trombones, and sort of doing a little bit of call and response with the trumpets as these little scurrying figures happen around them. And then the scurrying just gets crazy and just dips down. Listen to how the winds and the strings really play together seamlessly, but the strings really hold everything together, tie everything together against the more random placement of some of these little wind doublings. And then, of course, this beautiful horn chord going all the way through. You probably won't be able to really hear that bass trombone note on the bottom there, but it will secure this. And then just listen to just the beautiful way that this utterly creepy chord comes through. Notice how the fermata is on the end of the chord after it is softened, right? So it starts out fortissimo and lasts a couple of beats and then ends up with this long fermata. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the change of time signature here, but just be warned that it has happened and that there is no difference on the absolute rhythmic value of each note. It's just that the counting is going to seem to be half as fast as it was before, going from 5-4 to 5-2. Okay, let's have a listen to it.
Let's study one more section in this particular lesson. Starting off here, this is a beautiful way to score down in the basement. You've got Othri bassoons and contrabassoon, doubling with cellos and double basses. For this entire page, this melody is going to remain constant, basically just as unison octaves. There's going to be no harmonization whatsoever until we get to the next page. Now, it just starts out very, very simply, and this is one of the most cinematic moments of the entire suite, uh, not to mention this particular movement, which is also among the most cinematic. It really does describe uh, so generally the emotional reaction to seeing something that you can imagine any kind of vista before you that, you know, maybe like a, a very alien, very forbidding planet or no man's land between the trenches. There are a bunch of different ways that I could imagine this being set to a particular landscape of horror or unease or depression or, or any other kind of chaotic or negative emotion. But it's the emotional reactions, not really the programmatic essence of this piece, which makes it cinematic, rather than you know, really describing something that is really happening. It's more describing a reaction, an impression, a feeling. Now, other than that, very, very simple G-sharp tremolos, uh, just keeping everything very, very unsettled. I'm going to point something out here, and Holst does not hold to this all the time, but it's a reason why you shouldn't just scoff at things like double sharps. Here, the cellist and the double bassist are going to be reading this F double sharp as opposed to a G natural. Now, if they were to read a G natural, they might get the idea that they need to shift the finger which is holding down a G sharp, right? Because fingering is read by string players as a progressive series of diatonic notes. So if you're very careless and say you are intending to write a B and then an A sharp, but you end up writing a B flat instead because of your notation software, the string player will actually shift their finger from the B natural to the B flat. Whereas if you'd written it as A sharp, they might use the next finger down. Now the same thing is at work here. The cellist is starting holding down an A, then letting go to go to a G sharp, and then the next finger down has got the F double sharp. And the more that that is held to, the easier it is for the string player to finger it. Now, Holst does not hold to that at all times, nor can he really because of the way that, because of the particular mode that this melody is scored in. However, uh, he does it where he can, uh, and it, it really does help both the fluency of the idea and the fingering of the player. When we get to here, the G sharps in tremolo are taken over by octaves on the violas. And, you know, this might actually be playable as a double stop without too much problem. It's still going to be a bit of a stretch for the fingers, but I think it might well be playable, even in that lower position. But, you know, probably the players are going to just handle this divisi. Meanwhile, you have got octave Ds in our violins being the first note. So there's basically just sort of the same thing up a fourth in terms of pitch. And then spread across the octaves uh, D2, D3, D4, and D5. All being doubled by various winds. And here we got a great use of bass oboe here, doubling the bassoon. So that line is just incredibly solid now. And of course, English horn is playing the same pitches as the second violins. And oboes, uh, too, are playing the same pitches as the firsts. So this is like 
all of our double reeds. And it just has the most unearthly, penetrating sound. This feeling of just claustrophobic solidity that is adding together, combining with the strings. And when you add the timpani rolls that sort of push it and underline the dynamic contours of each of these little melodic phrases and, you know, adding the, you know, da-da-da-dum, dun-dun-dun, it's, it just is wonderful effect. Now, here is where we can talk a little bit about 5-2 and 5-4. So, obviously, we have run into this melody before. In fact, it was sort of the second theme to this entire piece, uh, back on uh, maybe the third page, second or third page of the original score. And it was played against the da 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 dun 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 rhythm, right? Now, this is the same rhythm still being played in 5-4 time. And there is just one missing beat here. da 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 dun 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 right Be but because of the gap the gap is sort of like taking the place of that missing beat and then you have that dun 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 so Hulse is reminding you of how the piece started and giving that rhythm a sinister character which it you know can't help but have with this kind of scoring now let's turn the page to see that Hulse is turning this back into a battalion style orchestration once again, groups of four-part woodwinds moving like piano chords, as we studied before, right? We've got our voicing of a 6-3 chord with the bass on the bottom, whatever bass instrument of each group is being used to fill in the harmony of the bass. Now, it's not always like filling it in where the pitch would be from a four-part right-hand piano chord right, with the thumb note being right there. It's an octave lower in many cases, as it would be here, for instance, with bass clarinet, and then the same thing here with the contrabassoon, and uh, bass oboe, though, is playing that C that is an octave below the top C of the oboes. Now here we have basically just added the tone color of the clarinets to the oboes. So... It's just a fuller, more band-like sound, especially with the top line being doubled by flutes, which is going to is still going to be effective, even though it's not the strongest register. You're still going to feel a bit of strength there from the flutes. It's not going to be totally weak, because we really have not added any brass yet, except for just the da 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 dum being played by third trumpet and uh, first trombone, an octave lower, and timpani coming in now and just really underlining this. Now notice the, uh, the poor fourth trumpet player and second trombonist and what they've got to hold and how long they've got to hold it. They're definitely going to be taking breaths in here and not just trying to make this one long continuous note. Some players could do that. I mean, it is... A piano dynamic but the crescendo here is going to start using up some breath and some force and it's just not a good idea to go that long without taking a breath especially since you have an a2 here and then you've got both trombones playing some harmony there the snare drum has turned into a roll and that really takes care of the rhythmic part of this passage continuing on the violins are playing a different voicing than the block chord voicings of these battalions of wind instruments. Instead of having a 6-3 chord proper, the middle note is being dropped an octave down, so you have this wonderfully widely spaced voicing. And just putting it all together, these voicings are all like root fifth in the left hand and then the mediant and the tonic at the top. So th that's a, a very, very common strategy for four-part harmony voicing. So here, it's all being played 
parallel. And with parallel voicings like this, you tend to hear a lot of overtones that just follow each other perfectly, especially if the if you have like naked fifths. You really hear the overtones on top following each other, and sometimes in a very unpleasant way. It doesn't really matter because you've got chords here, and the you know filling in the chord with especially with the major thirds, it tends to take away some of that. But if everything is parallel, then once again you start to feel that sense of uneasiness on top, and Holst is definitely taking advantage of that here. You can hear it more in the piano score, I think, than than as as easily in the orchestral version. In the orchestral version, it is just a sense of uneasiness rather than, you know, sheer terror for your eardrums. The horns come in. Once again, here you can you can see with these triads written out this way, just how basic this whole idea of moving around in parallels, just perfect parallel motion is. So the horns are basically going to be playing the same thing as the clarinets and the oboes, only an octave lower, which means that to an extent, the middle of these, or the lower two notes of these chords are going to be the same as the upper two notes of the bassoons. So it's just adding more and more to this whole very, very slowly ascending idea. Here we start to pick up some steam, piccolos coming in on the same pitches as the flutes, so this is really off four flutes right here. Uh, just a terrifically effective sound. At this point, uh, you know, Holst does not really even need to have the oboes to continue to double the top line. They are just going to become more subsidiary. And of course, the voicing is going to be changing a little bit harmonically. Interestingly, the strings pretty much stay in the middle of the orchestra here, with the firsts not leaping up you know, to play some of these higher pitches here. Holst is saving that up for right here. And it's pretty much, you know, the same kind of idea as before. The viola is playing an interesting cross voicing here in between the seconds and the firsts. And then the cellos and double basses, both on their written middle Cs, which of course concert for the cellos and an octave lower for the double basses. Now, I really love this here, how everything has been moving with these parallel harmonies. Then Holst suddenly drops that whole idea of parallel harmony and just goes for octaves in everything except for extremely strong, pungent instruments. So you've got the tenor trombones playing a little old F third here, octave higher the first and second trumpet, octave higher than that, the oboes. When you set up this sort of triple octave between these particular timbres, it's extremely penetrating and it does not really need an enormous amount of help. The rest of the orchestra can just play all these octaves and it's still going to fill in beautifully. So doubled first and seconds, octave lower than that, we've got violas and the octave lower, the cellos, and this way, every instrument is in its perfect place to be able to just go without doing any compromising straight up to this high E, slurring down to D. That is essentially doubled here by the clarinets, bass clarinet, and bassoons playing in tenor clef. So you've got the same triple octave going on here. And notice how, you know, this scoring of triple octaves for the clarinets here, I, I find that just really wonderful. Here they are doubling the bassoons and sort of splitting off in this way. And other instruments around them, like the bass oboe and the English horn, those are doubling as well. Now, the first clarinet here is powerful enough being pushed this high, that it doesn't really need the flutes to double it from above. The flutes can basically just amp the harmony higher and higher here. That's all they're needed to do. When you have these octave clarinets here, with the piccolo on top, the sound becomes just extremely piercing and powerful. So this is just, once again, one of those 
heroic, uh, happy bits of orchestration that works so well because it's just so simple and everything is being used to its most consonant strength. Let's have a listen to that. Uh, it's too much to go over everything that we just talked about, but let's have a listen to how all of that works now, and then I will see you. We'll pick things up in the next lesson as things get really huge on the next page.